Okay, you got a little more time for me today? Look at your neighbor and say, got it or not, he's going to take it. <laughs> Just kidding. You know, I got a, a really um, today, guys, I know while I speak, you're all going to be dreaming about your boats and your pools and the river, the lakes, whatever body of water you are going to find yourself by today. <laughs> See, there it is. See, yes, Lord. But uh, I have a pretty um, simple, but I hope uh, powerful and profound idea that I want to present to you guys. And the goal here, hold on, got to do it. I always forget. This is becoming my thing now. Somebody at the central campus literally has a piece of paper that is always ready that just says, for Tim's gum. <laughs> it's like, am I really that bad? I really am. The other day, I was at someone's house, and I used, like, I didn't have anywhere to put my gum, but there were sliced cucumbers. <laughs> so I used it like a gum coaster. <laughs> and just put it on the table. It was nice. And it worked out. Oh, Lord, help me. You know, I think um, for me, my hope is that I can present to you something somewhat simple and that you this week would take time to kind of untangle maybe some of the depths of how it works out in your own life. That this week I can give you like a bone to chew on of something that I think if we can get access to this thing that the scripture is calling us to, that I'm going to talk about this morning, that we would find higher levels of awareness of what God is already doing, which causes worship and gratefulness and thanksgiving to be a natural result of our lives. Not something we got to like force, but actually truly like we're meant to be astounded people. Do you know that? That you were designed for fascination? That God hand-wired every one of you to live responsive to beauty, to live responsive to things that are just like beyond almost your true comprehension to understand, and that you would respond to the Lord in like authentic wonder, not in the have-tos. You know what I'm saying? And so my heart is that today we would have greater capacity to see what the Lord is doing and respond in worship to him, more than songs, respond in worship. And two is that our capacity for obedience would actually grow. Anybody need a little bit more of that in their life? Just my capacity to say yes, not no, or to say yes, not later, Lord, because later is still no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want the capacity for, for us because I'm most interested when it comes to revival, when it comes to awakening, come on now, when it comes to seeing the presence of the Lord fill a community of people and fill the churches that they go to and fill the places that they work I'm less interested in, I mean, I don't feel like I have to choose, but if I had to pick between like a flash in the pan that's explosive and crazy outpourings of revival like we've seen and something that will actually last for my kids' kids to steward, I'm going to pick the latter. I'm going to pick seeing something happen so profound in the hearts of the church that is so healthy that it actually has capacity to be passed from one generation to another generation, which is like hard enough in and of itself. But then another generation and another. And however many generations happen to be between us and the end of all things. I don't know how many that is. Maybe you know, I don't know. I don't know how many generations we have left until the Lord, till the trumpet sounds, so the Lord comes back. I do not know. But what I know is that the promise was that the spirit of Elijah would be released in the earth. And what it says is that the hearts of sons would turn to fathers. The hearts of mothers would turn to daughters. 
What makes Elijah different than every prophet in the Old Testament is that he fully gave an inheritance to a generation behind him that wasn't even his flesh and blood. And that he is one of the only prophets that actually saw someone raised up behind him that brought increase to what he carried on his life. And that's what I'm interested in. And listen, it's not I hand off a baton because I lived my life in such a low, insignificant, non-impactful way that it was pretty easy to leapfrog me. This is freaking Elijah. Like the prophets of Baal, Jezebel, running like a horse, saw fire come down from heaven. Like this guy was legit. Lived a significant, incredible life. And yet, there was something that happened between these two guys that God says would be released in the earth through you guys. That Kingdom Life Church, even though we're just like this tiny little grain of sand in the global church, but that we want to be a part of whatever it is that God is doing. And I don't want to just look to like prophetic words about the unique expression and language of what God is doing. I want to actually be caught up in the timeless written word of God of what he promised would be released in the end days. Right? And the timeless word of God says that there is intergenerational revival and awakening that's going to be passed from generation to generation to generation. And the quality of the baton toss is going to increase as time goes on. But it's not just going to happen. It's one of those things that it's actually our intentionality and self-stewardship, what the Holy Spirit calls the, the, when you talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. This makes sense. Kindness, goodness, and self-control. The ability to steward, to some, it sounded like a kid said something funny. The ability to steward oneself in righteousness. Oh, excellent. That's awesome. And I love that that is actually a fruit of the Spirit of God. Not a church that's like one of those, uh, um, those uh, things out front of a, a car dealership that's just, I'm just way by the wind. My life is not my choice. I am not in control. I give up control. Of course, we yield, in a sense, we yield authority over what we do in submission to the Holy Spirit. But God doesn't make decisions for us. If he did, there would be no need for self-control. Listen, you can understand that joy could be a supernatural trait of God that by his spirit alone is established in who you are, right? That patience, God can work his patience into you and it feels like godliness. We attach that to this idea of self-control, right? That I through my choices in yieldedness to the values of God, the values of the kingdom of heaven, the values expressed in scripture can experience something that would cause me to be somebody that has something to give to the generation behind me. Are we here? And I want to talk about what I think is one of the most important keys in being able to participate in, again, seeing what God is doing and responding in worship and having our capacity for obedience increased. You ready? Proverbs 4, 23. Super popular scripture. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Or some versions say above all things. Why? For from it flows the springs of life. This word for watch over your heart, it literally means to monitor and observe your heart as if it is in a prison. As if your heart is the prisoner and your one job is to watch him. 
It's not like being a helicopter parent, you know, or, or wait, helicopter parent is when you hover, right? I, I take that back. It's like being a helicopter parent. <laughs> it's this intense, above all things, value that you watch over your heart. But a really important question that we have to ask, because obviously Solomon has put a heavy level of importance on the scripture. So it's important that we know when he says, watch over your heart, that we know what we are looking for, right? Some people read this scripture and believe that the idea of watching over your heart is trying to be aware of the potential of sinful motives happening on the inside of you. And I can see the heart of where that would come from, the desire to live clean and holy before the Lord, but I promise you, you can't do it. Like self-awareness is good. I love that. But we're talking about a scripture where, where you are literally, your whole person is given to monitoring the activity of this one thing. Friends, you cannot do the Holy Spirit's job. It doesn't say in the scripture, search yourself and know yourself and point out all of your own wicked ways so that you can make them straight. It says, God, search me, know me. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict you. Don't take his job. You're not that good at it. Your timing's wrong. You don't say things right. So that's not what he's talking about. Some people say, guard your heart, watch your heart above all things. As it, and it's this idea of like, you know, don't throw your pearls before swine and, you know, don't, don't guard your heart. Keep it from being hurt by people that are unsafe. You know, guard your heart. You got to guard your heart above all things. You're getting into this relationship. You need to guard your heart above all things. And obviously there's wisdom uh, in some of these situations. But to say again, above everything else, I need to like protect my heart. And I get the wisdom of that. My only issue is I don't see that modeled in the life of Jesus. I've never seen Jesus do that before. I don't like making something a really high value that I've never seen Jesus do. That I never saw the Father do. And again, there's some wisdom to this. There's some balance to this that you're going to have to flesh out. But we need to live in a reality where, yes, we're finite. Yes, there's a real uh, value in, in uh, allowing our hearts to be in trusted hands, right? And to have people around us that will value our hearts. But really, above all things, keep yourself protected from other people that might hurt you? No. That's not what this is about. You see, we see what this scripture is about in the second half of this verse, when it says what's intended to happen. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. I honestly believe that what Solomon is exhorting us to in this scripture is to actually monitor the softness of your heart so that rivers of living water actually have the ability to flow on the inside of you. There's this idea in Scripture. It's a scary idea, but it's a real one. And it's in the Old Testament, it's in the Gospels, and it's in the New Testament. It's this idea of having a hardened heart. And it's this idea of having a heart that becomes so calloused, it actually cannot see the Lord. Isn't that wild? Actually, a heart could become so calloused. You can go to Mark 6. It can become so calloused that it could actually miss out on the miraculous in our life. Mark 6, 51. Remember, the first thing I want us to be able to do is expand our capacity to see the Lord, to be aware of what he's doing, 
Like, I'm not fixing to get over the fact that Matt and Carla have twins. Like, I'm not moving on past the brilliance of God in the miracle of God and that it was prophesied that people in our, did you know that? Did you know that two years before this happened, Julian Adams stood up, he's a prophet at the central campus, and he said, there's going to be couples in your church that begin to have twins in about two years, and it's going to be a sign of a multiplication of the harvest that's coming to the church. And almost exactly two years later, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be familiar and too cool to be excited about that. Right? I'm not trying to have my heart hardened so that I don't see the beauty and the brilliance of God and supernaturally him working in their lives to fulfill his promise. Because when I actually take that in, we have capacity to not just go, good for you guys, but the capacity to see God's hand in it, my ability to worship increases because my mind is blown because I'm designed to be fascinated. And we see the disciples... And Mark 6 just experienced one of these miracles that I just, how do you miss this? But they did. Jesus just multiplied a lunch, a Big Mac meal, and fed thousands of people with it. And there was extra. You know this story? The loaves and the fishes. The disciples come to Jesus, say, we don't have enough food for these guys. This kid has a lunch. He has a few fish, some loaves of bread. Jesus gives thanks, puts it in the baskets, breaks them up into groups, and begins to just hand out food, and it multiplies. But listen to this. This is insane to me. And then later on, after the feeding of the 5,000, is when we actually see them on the uh, on the sea, and this is the moment where they see Jesus walking on the sea. This happens right after. You tracking with me? And in this moment, they have a lot of these aha moments. They see the Lord in his power and his brilliant splendor walking on water. It's another moment for these guys to be like, this is the Christ. It's really him. Right? And their eyes get open, their hearts get opened, and look what happens in verse 51. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. That's what I'm looking for. Greatly amazed within myself beyond measure and marveling. That's the heart of a worshiper. That's the heart of somebody. Again, I'm not just talking about singing. I'm talking about when you're in your job, like living greatly amazed beyond, like marveling, like whatever it says there. I've already forgot the phrase. But listen to this, verse 52. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Literally, y'all, you can't even like fathom this. They watched Jesus multiply a lunch for a thousand people and missed it. Not because they were busy, not because they had bad vision, but because their hearts were hardened. What? Listen, we're not talking about missing the ethereal sense of what God is doing among the church as we worship. We are talking about a physical, creative miracle displaying the power of Jesus and his followers missed it because their hearts were hardened. They couldn't see it. I feel like we can't even like connect with that idea because it's like, how could the state of my heart affect my ability to see something that is so beyond, you could not like, it's unmissable, it feels like. But the Bible is really clear that it is. I wonder how much the church misses out on It would feel so unrelated. It would feel so unrelated that 
you know, my heart being hardened because I'm experiencing like some bitterness and unforgiveness in this other area of my life that like you don't get to selectively choose when we walk in like sin in that way. Unforgiveness is sin. You know that, right? Have your process, but unforgiveness is sin because anything that's not like Jesus is sin. In our weakness, we need to process. I totally get that. I'm in the process too in my own life. It's been Good God, my whole year has just been like forgiving people that hurt me, I feel like. And it's like as intentional, as active as I can cause my heart to be and throwing myself in a process of forgiveness because I don't want to live in sin. Forgiveness is not operational equipment on the journey. It is the engine for you to move forward. Like this is required to follow Jesus. He says some scary stuff. Like, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. I don't say I know exactly what that means, but it scares the living daylights out of me. I'm not interested in finding out. <laughs> but we don't get to selectively choose which parts of our heart become hardened over time when we engage in stuff like negligence and bitterness and just not even caring about the state of our own hearts, when we're not actually doing the thing that Solomon asked us to do, which is above everything else, guard your heart. Above everything else, watch over the softness of the soil of your heart. The parable of the sower, right? I don't want a rocky, stony heart that gets uprooted the moment the troubles of life come along, where the seed of the kingdom can't even get inside of my heart and grow. Because it's not soft enough? You don't get to choose which parts of your hearts become so hardened or not. It happens to you. And so we don't realize it, but we've got these areas of compromise or of difficulty in our life where we're or disobedience, to be honest. I'm sorry to be so intense about this, but they create a callousness in our hearts. And we don't get to decide how that callousness affects us. You don't get to choose that. The disciples didn't consciously choose to not be able to see Jesus multiply food in front of them because their hearts were hard. It happened to them. But the remedy was when they beheld the Lord in his power and his beauty. And in the same way, you don't get to choose how your eyes get opened when you actually behold the Lord as he is. <laughs> they weren't thinking about the fishes and the loaves on that boat. They saw God in his power and all of a sudden, boom, softness hit their heart and the ability to perceive the miraculous that happened in their past was restored to them and all the worship they were supposed to have been collecting, all the, like the reason, the motivation for worshiping they were supposed to be collecting through that season got restored to them and they were caught up to speed. And that's the goodness of the Lord. Whole seasons of your life could have been given to bitterness, but in one encounter with Jesus where you see him as he is and you see him in his power, all of a sudden the softness of your heart causes you to see a whole past season differently and causes the reproach of it to lift off of you as your heart softens and you can now see what God was doing when your eyes were closed, in essence. And it's restored to you in that day. Because I know some of us, like we get in these places, it's, whether it's in marriage or our family or friends, where we can go a long time with a little bit of hardness or a lot of bit of hardness. I don't want any scales over my eyes. I just don't. I want, I want eyes that stay pure, that can actually see God. Not that I'm perfect, but that... I'm actually making, again, I'm not calling you to be perfect. I'm calling you to do what Solomon asked us to do. Above everything else, watch and monitor the softness of your hearts before the Lord. When he's in, moving in the room, is anything happening on the inside of you? You don't have to be crazy like me. You don't have to scream and sweat and get crazy. You can just be solemn and cool and chill like Matt. But in, I promise you, inside of Matt and Carla, they're burning. And their hearts are burning and on fire and they're moved. It's not just towards the Lord, but it's towards people. Don't act like you can have a soft heart towards God and a hard heart toward your brother and your sister. Eh, wrong answer. One and the same. It is. I'm saying it just is. 
Who can say they love God and yet hates their brother? You know what the word for hate means? It doesn't mean to despise and like, ugh. it just means to love less. That's all it means. That when this person comes into my mind, I go, ugh, that's all it is. That's all it takes. Boom. And you qualify. <laughs> and I'm thankful for mercy. I'm thankful for grace. I'm thankful for a, a journey of being sanctified before the Lord. Like, I'm thankful that I can still be a son in his house, and he's helping me. And we're all broken. We're all figuring it out. But, hey, we got to be honest about the state of things before we can start to make some cleanup happen. You know what I'm saying? Because, yeah. Yeah. again, I'm interested in longevity. I don't want the inability to see the Lord moving on my life, moving in the rooms that I'm in, moving in the situations of my life to keep me from having an inheritance to give my daughter Abigail, to give the spiritual sons and daughters that are going to come after me to take this thing that we're doing. It's not even about KLC. It's just about the church and global like revival in New England. Maybe we don't see revival in New England in my day. Maybe we move the needle forward. But maybe it's going to be like David and Solomon, where our kids, the next generation, is going to build everything in our hearts. All I know is I want to be the type of person that actually has a heart that can receive something that could be given away. You can't respond to what you don't see. And you won't be able to see why our hearts are hardened. You know the other thing it does? We can go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 10, I think, 11, 19, and 20. The softening of the heart is really the open door to you walking in obedience. We've talked about beholding the Lord and the softness of your heart, giving you the ability to see the beauty and the fullness of the nature of God. But the softening of your heart is actually also linked to your ability. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. The proof of love is obedience. You love that message? The proof of your love for Jesus is that when he says jump, we say how high. And I don't care what it costs me, right? That's where we all want to be at. And this thing of soft-heartedness, listen to what it says here, Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20. Ezekiel's prophesying, and this is actually to us, as the, as the New Testament church, he says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them. It will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Boom! There it is. That's the intention of God for the church in the end days. Why? Next verse. What's it going to accomplish? So I'll give them a heart of flesh. Why? That they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and what does it say do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God I love that it says they shall keep my judgments and do them how many of you just want to be a person who follows through <laughs> I want the peace and the joy that comes with what I believe for being aligned with what I do. I want the joy of actually having a life where what I understand about God in the scriptures has fully overtaken what I actually follow through in my life. Just me? <laughs> Softening the heart is the open door here to keeping his statutes and his judgments. You know, his judgments represent the in-the-moment commands of God. It's the whisper throughout the day. And his statutes represent his written word. You want greater capacity to, like, actually adhere to the written word of God as you study. You can study all you want, but you do with a hard heart, you're going to miss the Lord and you're going to miss obedience. You will. Because it's the softness of your heart that lends itself towards obedience to the word of God. Because friends, a lover 
will outwork a worker any day of the week. You will do for love what you would never do for duty. And I love a sense of, of duty towards the Lord, of obligation to serve him. And that's beautiful. And I think there's a level of that respect and honor in the kingdom that I, I just think is so valid. But I just think of this part of the scriptures, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. And the Lord's looking for a people. I mean, what friendship would we have with hardened hearts? What capacity do we have where friendship is it's like two hearts like coming together? And like being there for each other, it's like flames that kind of come together. We see that obviously super expressed in like that marriage covenant and that unity of marriage, but there's like lesser versions of that. But like the hard heart, it's like won't do it. I want to have friendship with God. And I want my obedience to be from love. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Not if you revere me. Yeah, that's a part of it. But the, the, the fear of the Lord is wrapped in the love of God. What does it say in Ephesians? It says that you would be holy and blameless in love. Love would be actually the vessel that contains the holiness of your walk with the Lord. Try loving God with a hardened heart. Or don't, actually. That's the whole point of this message, is don't. <laughs> Last scripture, Hebrews 3. This is, where, this is where our responsibility kicks in for each other. Hebrews 3, verse 13 says, But, it, well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to read verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you in an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Listen to this. This is, this is the, pres the prescription for this. But exhort one another every day. Say every day. every day. As long as it's called today, listen, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's a lot of talk in the church about accountability. And the idea, even outside of the church, of being held accountable to what's valuable. Men will have a value for sexual purity. So if they're smart, they'll create accountability to stay attached to that value in their life, right? We got goals in our life. I want to grow my business. So you got health goals, whatever. I got some health goals. Talk about it. Super stoked. I need accountability to help keep myself attached to my values when it becomes not desirable for me to do that. We need to actually, if this scripture is true, we need to daily exhort each other to keep our hearts soft so that we don't end up in deception. Think about accountability like this. What would it be like for a church, for a whole movement in the church, where the regular daily accountability that was flowing in submission and relationship between brothers and sisters wasn't sin conscious, have you sinned or not? It was, and I'm not saying that's not important, but the primary conversation is what is the status of your heart before the Lord? The question is, are you good soil? Are you breathable soil that the spirit of God, the seed of the kingdom, the word of God can actually be planted in you so that something could be established. I have a feeling that if a church could actually walk out the softness of heart that leads us to worship and adoration and seeing the miraculous in what otherwise would be ordinary moments, and if we could actually walk through the doors of obedience and like longevity and having softness of heart that we would come to the end of our time on the earth with an actual baton to pass, with an actual mantle to give to the next generation. And that would be the softness of our hearts. If there's something I want 
Abigail, my daughter, to inherit from me. It's not just the revelation. It's not the heart and the passion for worship and the presence of the Lord. That's a part of it. But I want her to have what's going to cause it to be where she gets to the end of her life and she has a a mantle to give away. And that's the softness of heart because you have to fight for it. You have to fight for having a soft heart. Man, everything in life, the rage of the enemy is to harden your heart heart. This all he wants to do is to get you calloused. In Ephesians 4, it talks about you're not like the Gentiles who live in the futility of their mind because their understanding is darkened because they don't know because it says of the hardness of their heart. And because of that, in the next verse, it says they give themselves over to all kinds of lusts. The thing that makes you different from them is the Spirit of God inside of you softening your heart. That's what makes us different. So my encouragement to you this week, this is the bone I want you to chew on, is, is my heart hard? That's your first question. And that's not always black and white. Sometimes it's like, yeah, kind of. What did Jesus call it? Stony ground. It's not a rock yet, but there's a lot of rocks in the soil. And then the next question that I want you to ask the Lord is what do I need to do to soften my heart? And then do it. And if you're not sure if you can, phone a friend and do what Hebrews 3 tells us to do. Daily encourage each other that our hearts wouldn't get hard and be given to sin. Is that okay? (sighs) Ah. Man, I, y'all don't even know what it's like to, to lead worship in a room of soft-hearted people. We can go anywhere. We can do anything. Or to lead, uh, to lead um, evangelism on the streets with soft-hearted people. I don't need gifted, eloquent people. I need people whose hearts can be pricked in a moment by the Holy Spirit. That when the Holy Spirit whispers in a crowd, we're not so dull we can't hear them. All right, I'm done, I'm done. Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? <laughs> man God, God I just feel the joy of the Lord uh, this, I feel like for some of us we're connecting the dots of some of the issues that we've been facing in our lives some of the hamster wheels that we've been on and we just found the way to jump off so Holy Spirit I ask right now Holy Spirit I ask for conviction I am asking for my own heart And we're all in this room in agreement, Lord, that we want the conviction of the Holy Spirit where there's hardness of our hearts. Lord, I don't want to be any soil from 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 your parable, Jesus, about the sower. I don't want to be any soil other than the soil that could receive your word. So, Lord, I pray for people who need it for revelation on being legacy-minded for revelation on longevity, for revelation that your life is about more than what you'll eat and drink for the day and what and happiness and personal fulfillment, that your life is about what you're giving to the next generation, what you're giving to the Lord in the time you have here. Release that revelation. And God, I ask right now, whew, some of you actually are in this room and I can feel the Lord coming to you, actually confirming the softness of your heart and confirming the work that you've done to actually maintain forgiveness. And there's some of you that you're actually leaving today before the Lord with a little badge of honor, like well done. There's always more work to do, but there's like a well done that's landing on some of you. And how you've just chosen to keep your heart really, really, really clean and pure, even when the people around you maybe weren't doing such a great job. So I release that affirmation from the Father to increase. And God, for those of us that are in that process, Lord, I ask for supernatural grace on us to not just in drudgery, but in joy, begin to run, run and see the Lord and see the places where he is melting our hearts to be a heart of flesh. God, we just sign up for that wholeheartedly in Jesus' name. Amen.